How many of you guys had a really good 4th of July? Woo, all right. We had some, that's good. Anybody, anybody go on vacation or anything fun like that? Yeah, all right, we got a few. Well, for me and my wife, our highlight of the 4th of July area is to go to the Oakland County Fair on the first Saturday of it starting. I think it starts on a Friday, but you got to go on Saturday night because Saturday night at the Oakland County Fair down in Davisburg, Michigan is Twisted Trailer Night. If, if nobody knows what that is, is it's a small little track and they bring out a bunch of little uh, cars and stuff and they're racing around and then the highlight of the show is Twisted Trailers. These same beat up cars that people have spent hours working on and trying to make look good and, and run well. What they do is at the end of the night, they, they hook up trailers and you can bring your own trailer. It could be a boat on a trailer. It could be an old camper. It could be uh, some of the guys had uh, uh, like a utility trailer with a lawnmower strapped down to it. Uh, somebody was pulling a snowblower behind it on a trailer. The only regulations is that you have a trailer and that you have something on it. And then they start the race. And uh, I don't know if you can show that picture. I don't know if Julie was able to get it up for me. What they do is they go in a figure eight and they're racing. And you can imagine cars are smashing into trailers and trailers are being destroyed. And, and uh, sometimes to, to win the race, all you have to do is have your trailer dragging behind you, even if it's, it just has to stay connected. And uh, so it's called Twisted Trailers. It may be a little bit hard to see if you're in the back row. This is the reason why you need to be in the front row so that you can see really cool stuff like this. But, uh, yeah, it is chaos. There's a boat over here. There's an old camper, pop-up camper right here. There's a utility trailer with, a, I think, a little lawnmower in that or something. And, uh, but anyways, that's one of our favorite nights. And then on top of it, they have a carnival that's going on, right? So you can get all the carny food. So last night at about 10.30 at night, I ate a big old bowl of chili cheese fries. And um, I, I haven't yet. I haven't yet. But um, I thought maybe I was going to be tired this morning, but maybe those chili f cheese fries is the fuel I needed. But, um, but anyways, it's a great time. But, but think about this, right? These guys... You know, they got these beater cars and stuff, but they got to put a lot of work into them to try to make them work and to, to run. And they spend a lot of time and involvement in it. And then in just a matter of minutes, their car is destroyed or the thing that they've been working on has been destroyed. And I think sometimes in our, in our Christian lives, we're kind of the same way. Our lives, we're kind of like twisted trailers. We're we're just a wreck waiting to happen a lot of times. And, uh, you know, we spend a lot of time trying to make ourselves look good, to get ourselves running, and we can easily destroy our life or, or go into demolition mode in a matter of minutes, and it doesn't take much. And so one of the reasons why we, we have church and why we have sermons and why we gather together is because we are a big jumbled mess, and we need the power of Christ to come and to heal us and to give us that abundant life that we need and to help us to overcome sin, to help us overcome all the different temptations that we are faced with as a people uh, who live in a sinful and broken world. And we need... Um, we need the love of Christ, and we need everything that God offers. And so, uh, you can take that picture off, otherwise I'll, I'll just keep going on, I think. But here we are in another 
on the latter part of the 4th of July weekend, right? And, and the, the 4th is all about fireworks and freedom and just having a, having a good time, but really celebrating those freedoms that people in our country have died for so that we can um, celebrate that. But really, it's our independence, right, from uh, the English kings and uh, England that was controlling us at that time. And, and we wanted our independence, right? We wanted our freedom. And this country fought for that, and we celebrate that on July 4th. And the same thing is, is God is fighting for our freedom, right? We need to break away from the sin and the bondage and the, and the chaos and the messes that we make. And we need to learn to trust him, to surrender our lives to him in so many different ways. Last week, we, we talked about Psalm 99. So this week, I thought... Well, I didn't think. I was just kind of praying about it. And the Lord led me to Psalm 33. And that's where we're going to be here today. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And uh, so we're going to be in Psalm chapter 33 today. It was kind of interesting because as I was kind of led to this chapter, I started reading through it and it was very similar to to last week's message in Psalm 99. Um, there, there's a few things that are different, but there are some things that are kind of similar in a theme. So what I figure is, if you guys didn't remember what I read at the beginning of last week, then maybe you didn't remember the sermon either. And so maybe God has something that he wants us to hear and to say again. And I'm sure it's going to be delivered in a little bit different way, but uh, let's start off with uh, verse 1. Shout for joy in the Lord, O you righteous. Praise befits the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with the lyre. Make melody to him with the harp of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. We talked last week about shouting for joy and basically celebrating and praising and worshiping God through music and through different instruments because God is worthy of our praise. And God loves music and God gave us the gift of music and the ability to praise him through song and through instruments and different things like that. But he wants us to shout for joy in the Lord. And we should shout for joy, right? He's God. He's our Savior. We should be excited to be able to praise and to worship him. To be able to give him thanks. To sing him a new song. We have a lot to be thankful for in this country. You know, we think about our freedoms and... I don't know how many of you have ever been in another country. Uh, I've been over in India and, and have taught pastors over there and, and given them um, some advice and helping them to connect the dots because they don't have a lot of training over there in the Bible. But they have a passion for the Lord. But over in that part of India where I was at, there were, you know, it was a mixture of of middle class, upper class, and third world environment, all there in the same place. And on the, there were some people living in boxes on the street right next to, you know, a nice mansion. And it really was kind of a crazy dynamic. But we have it really great here in America. And we need to be thankful for that. You know, we think about all the things that that God has given us. He's given us salvation. He's given us an eternal hope. He's given us a comfortable life, really, here in America. And um, so sometimes we need to really think, think about our perspective and our situation. You know, when, when our life turns into twisted trailers, sometimes we need to keep perspective that somebody else may be going through something even more difficult or maybe something more twisted than what we're going through. So we always need perspective 
But as we shout for joy and we praise God in all the different aspects and all the different blessings that he's given us, I, I searched up a little bit because I wanted to talk a little bit about that perspective so that we can put this into a good understanding of where we're at as a people in this world. The, the average American lifestyle in terms of income and standard of living is significantly higher compared to the global average. Here are some key points to illustrate this comparison. Number one, income. The median household income in the United States is around $68,700 as of recent data. Globally, the median income is much lower. According to the World Bank, the median global income is estimated to be around $10,000 per year. So we're at 68.7, and the world's average is around 10,000. Number two, poverty line. The U.S. poverty line for a family of four is approximately $26,500 per year. Globally, the World Bank's international poverty line is $1.90 per day, which equates to about $693 per year. Standard of living. The Human Development Index, HDI, is a measure that combines income, education, and a life expectancy. The United States ranks high on this index, indicating a high standard of living. Many developing countries much lower, have much lower HDI scores, reflecting poorer access to education, health care, and lower life expectancy. Number four, global wealth distribution. According to the Credit Global Wealth Report, the top 1% of the world's population holds more than 40% of the global wealth. An average American often falls within the top 10% of the global income distribution. Percentage-wise, Americans generally fall into the top 10 to 20% of the world's income distribution. Many American households are in the top 5 to 10% globally. When comparing the standard of living, Americans are among the top nations, often ranking in the top 10 to 20% in terms of HDI. In summary, the average American lifestyle when compared to global standards ranks quite high, typically within the top 10 to 20 percent of the world in terms of income and standard of living. So when you hear numbers like that, you know, you keep things in perspective. We have it pretty good here in America. We are a blessed nation. We are a blessed country. And that's something that we need to uh, not take for granted. But the Bible also says that for a lot that is given, much is expected, right? And so as a country, I know the United States, I didn't look up the numbers, but I know Generosity-wise, the United States supports a lot of things, uh, whether it's tragedies, whether it's um, uh, world crisis and things like that. Americans spend a lot of money and are in those higher percentages of giving and donating and supporting people. But we live in a great country, and we need to keep, keep that in mind as we go through our lives and keep that perspective in and we have a lot, lot to be thankful for, a lot to shout for joy. Next, let's go on, let's continue on in Psalm 33, starting in verse 4. For the word of the Lord is upright, and all his work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. So here we see the word of the Lord is upright. All of his work that he does is in faithfulness. God is continually fulfilling his promises. God is continuing to exact 
his righteous plan as he moves through things. You know, we just talked about perspective a little bit. You know, a lot of times we are, we're so consumed with our life and, and everything that is going on. And, and when we get into chaotic situations sometimes, um, or, or maybe there's a life transition change that happens, whether it's a job, whether it's you got to move, uh, or maybe it's something more traumatic. But we need to realize that God is sovereign. God has a plan. God is in control of things. His word is upright, and everything he does is working for our good. He's working out his righteous plan. God loves righteousness, and he wants us to live righteous. But God also loves justice, and we know that our sin requires payment, that our sin requires justice. And God will exact that justice at the right time in his plan as he works it out. We already know that the plan has been set into motion and that what Jesus did on the cross and died for us has prepared the way for us to have that eternal hope, that life of eternity. But it's all because of the steadfast love of the Lord. And it says here, I love in... Uh, verse 5, he loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. I love when people say, you know, man, God's not here. God's not near. Right? Where is he? Right? The Bible here is saying that the earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. We just may not be seeing it because we're, maybe we're not looking for it. But God is there. He is near. And really, when we ask those kind of questions, it's not because God isn't near. It's because we are the ones that are strained. We are the ones that He has to come after. But the Word of God is upright. All of His work is done in faithfulness. By the words of Jesus, the heavens were made. By his breath, everything was made. When Jesus spoke, it came to light. When Jesus spoke to the disciples when they were on the sea and it was tossing and turning and it was raging, he said to be still in the raging seas, calmed. When Lazarus was dead for many days in the grave, and he said, Lazarus, come out. Lazarus conquered death and came out of the grave, right? God is working, and when Jesus commands things, and when Jesus speaks, things happen, and good things happen. His bre- <clears throat> It says in, uh, in, in 2 Timothy that all Scripture is breathed out by God. Right? God's Word is spoken. God's Word is not only spoken, but it is active. It is transformational. And when Jesus speaks, He works in our lives in a way that put us on a path towards righteousness towards justice, and towards all of these things. Let's continue on in verse 6. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth all their host. He gathers the waters of the sea as a heap. He puts the deeps in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. When you guys hear the word fear, fear of the Lord, what comes to your mind? Right? What comes to your mind when you think of fear of the Lord? Is it is it I'm afraid or is it 
respect, right? Or a reverence. If Jesus were to come into this room right now, what would be your response? Would you bow? Would you fall on your face? I know some of you probably would just run up and grab them, give them a big old bear hug. Some of you might kind of sit back and kind of hang because you're like, wait a minute, this is Jesus. What are you, what are you doing, right? There's a, there's a reverence. There's a respect. There's a fear. Um, I was going to use, I, I used the illustration of Jesus because I thought, well, maybe if I did like the president or something like that, or a president, they don't seem to be getting the respect that uh, people have as much for them. But still at the end of the day, you know, the president of the United States or a king, an earthly king or something like that, would demand respect and awe and reverence. And Jesus demands that as well, and he's, He's worthy of that for sure. And so we need to think about when we look back on, you know, God's word is upright, and that when Jesus speaks, things happen. You know, do we really believe that in our lives? You know, do, do, you know, we use the example of the twisted trailers, right? When your life gets to be that messed up, you know, do you really believe that God can speak and change things in your life and work in them? And are you seeking after that? Are you trying to learn God's voice? Are you trying to see Him work? And are you going to Him and asking Him? So do we believe that in our life? Right? Are we going to bow down? Are we going to fall on our face? Are we going to run to Him? He commands it and it stands firm. Like I said, He stops the raging seas. When He says, it is finished, on the cross, it is finished. When He said, I'm going to die for your sins, and that if you believe and confess that I am Lord and you believe that I was raised from the dead, it says you will be saved. And when God died on the cross, Jesus said, it is finished. There is no more. The only thing we have to do is to accept that and to believe that and to go from head knowledge to heart acceptance. Flip with me. We're going to jump ahead and then we're going to come back a little bit. Go to verse 18. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear Him, on those who hope, who hope in His steadfast love, that He may deliver their soul from death and keep them alive in famine. The eye of the Lord is fixed on those who fear Him. That should be comforting to know that you have a God that is not distant. You have a God that is watching every waking moment of your life. Now that should make you a little nervous. I remember um, when my kids were in, um, in, in high school and they went to prom and all that kind of stuff. You know, the joke was always when you're dancing, make sure there's enough room for you and you and your date, but there's enough room for Jesus to be in between, you know, and uh, right. But when you're when you're a kid or when you're a person, you know, sometimes I think we forget that when we are saved and we accept Christ into our heart, we're filled with the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is God's presence and is a part of us, and so therefore, Christ is with us every moment. Christ's eyes are fixed on us, watching what we do. Luckily, the Holy Spirit convicts us and gives us comfort, but it does convict us and move us in the right direction. So we can be thankful for that. But his eyes are fixed on those who fear him and await the hope of what his steadfast love brought us through the cross 
and the resurrection. Let's flip back to verse 10 now. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the peoples. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. The people whom he has chosen as his heritage. The nation's plans are frustrated by God. I don't know if you guys have seen this. Our average age in here is probably pretty decent up this level or whatever, right? Which means we have a lot of experience and a lot of wisdom. But we've also seen a lot. You've heard me talk about my wife's grandmother who just died at 106. Imagine what she was able to experience. I mean, she went through World War I, World War II, Vietnam, Korea, the Great Depression, you know, the, the Roaring Twenties, you know, all of those things, right? All of these historical things that she was able to go through and to experience. And she could probably see that at different times, it seemed like nations were getting away with certain things, but then eventually their plans were always frustrated because God is in control and God is only going to allow what he wants to allow. And there, those are some things that we don't necessarily understand because we're not God. We know his ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. So sometimes we can't comprehend why he allows different things. But we also know that we live in a sinful, broken world that has free will. And we know with free will, that puts us in a position to do bad things. And God gives us that freedom, but with that comes consequences and comes responsibilities as well. Definitions of political systems. Communism. You have two cows. The government takes both of them and gives you part of the milk. Socialism. You have two cows. The government takes one and gives it to your neighbor. Fascism. You have two cows. The government takes both cows and sells you the milk. Nazism. You have two cows. The government takes both cows, then shoots you. Bureaucracy. You have two cows. The government takes both of them, shoots one, milks the other, then pours the milk down the drain. Does that sound familiar? Capitalism. You have two cows. You sell one of them and buy a bull. In a democracy, everyone has two cows. Then a vote is taken, and whatever the majority decides to do, you do, and that's no bull. <laughs> political systems, right? Man, we live in a hypersensitive political world right now especially with an election coming up, right? Everything, all you hear about on the news, you know, especially right now, is, is Biden going to step down? Should he step down? You know, and it's all going back and forth. And then you just have the normal election type stuff that's going on. And, and uh, I know it can be kind of chaotic for us. If, it's, if you're feeling overwhelmed by all of it, turn off the TV. Turn off the radio, because I guarantee you that by doing so, you will be happier and that you'll probably find that not much has changed anyways, right? Yes, we need to vote and we need to be um, a part of the system and we need, because God needs good Christian men and women involved in politics, business, vet, vet school, nursing, engineering, wherever. God needs his people in all of these places. So I'm not saying be, ac be absent from the political realm, but know that a nation's plans are frustrated by God. God is going to allow what he's going to allow. And that's comforting to know that he is in control. Next we find in verse 12, 
Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom he has chosen as his heritage. We live in America that was founded on God. The founding fathers, the world will tell you, history will tell you, or modern history, will try to rewrite things and stuff. But there is no denying, if you know history, that God was a part of the founding of America and that his people, some were good, some were not, some had theist views and different things like that, but for the most part, they believed in a God who was sovereign and was in control of their life and they were willing to surrender and they were willing to make sacrifices to have freedom to show the world what true freedom really means from some of these countries that they fled from and started a new world. It's pretty amazing when you think back to like the 17, like the, what was it, 17, let's see, Columbus sailed the ocean blue in, was it 1492? Is that right? Right, so even back to then, there was like supposedly nobody in America, right? Maybe some... Um, Native Indians or something. I, I have no idea about that. But, um, but they started a new country, right? And they started it with freedom, but it was founded on God's word. It was founded on God himself. And it says in verse 12, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. I believe America has been blessed in many ways, because we have made him a priority from the beginning. Now, like most people, whether it was the Israelites when they were wandering in the wilderness, whether it's, it's just the natural cause of sin and all of that stuff, we tend to wander. We are sheep who are a part of the flock, but we still want to go our own way. And I feel like our country, in a lot of ways, is trying to go its own way. There's a lot of good that is still happening, but there's a lot of chaos that's going on as well, which leads us to believe that we are wandering as a country. And we need to, as Christians, we need to make sure that this country stays a nation whose God is the Lord Jesus Christ. We are a part of his heritage to those who believe. We are a part of his heritage, right? We've talked about being adopted sons and daughters. We know that God loves righteousness and justice in his timing. And we know that God's word, there were many times where God's people and people who weren't of God were disciplined in severe ways. But I want us to make sure that as we celebrate the 4th of July and we celebrate America and the freedoms and the blessings that we have, I also want you to understand that it is good to be an American. The bald eagle is great. The flag is great. And whether you're a Trump or Biden fan, doesn't matter. What we have here in America and what we strive for politically does not come before God. The blessings of America, the freedom, etc., it comes as a result of our country following God in the early days and staying focused as a nation. And we need to strive for that. But all things American do not trump and I'm not talking about Donald Trump, do not trump God, does not trump Jesus. So as we go and as we vote and as we defend what we believe to be our moral rights and things like that, our patriotism doesn't trump our faithfulness to our Lord and Savior and our Creator in, in those things. 
go to verse 13. The Lord looks down from heaven. He sees all the children of man. From where he sits enthroned, he looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the hearts of them all and observes all of their deeds. The Lord looks down from heaven. He sees all of the children of man. He sits enthroned. He looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. He observes all their deeds. No matter what happens here in this country, no matter what happens here in this world, the Lord has the best seat in the house. He is sitting on His throne, looking out over His people, watching them, observing their deeds. And no matter what happens, no matter who wins this war, who wins that war, who wins this political office, who wins that political office, Jesus Christ still sits on the throne. He is seeing the good and all the bad, observing all of our deeds. He sees all that we do in secret. He sees all that we do out in the open. Maybe we need to make sure that we are reflecting Christ and we are remembering that His Spirit is in us. And maybe that should make us think about what we do. A friend of mine sends out this text message to a group of people. I don't know how many people he has on his text message, but I'm in it. And he sends a verse and then a little thought that goes along with it. And uh, this one I just wanted to read to you guys. He sent to me the other day, Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 2. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. And then his comments. This is a crazy time in the world today. Everybody and everything is trying to grab my attention and my energy. Wars, weather, elections, and chaos is flying at me nonstop. Yes, I need to be concerned. I need to be patriotic. And I need to be passionate. But mostly, I need to be His. I need to have the mind, the spirit, and the love of Jesus. I can't get caught up in arguments where no one wins and relationships are lost. Be careful with that on Facebook or Instagram. I can't get caught up in arguments where no one wins and relationships are lost. I need to keep focused on the eternal. Dear Lord, please help me. Amen. Is what he wrote. Man, that is so true right? At the end of the day, God sits on the throne. What is going to happen is going to happen. And we got to figure out how we can be used in a way that is honoring to him and works for all things. Let's go to verse 20. We'll wrap up here. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart is glad in Him because we trust in His holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us even as we hope in you. Does your soul wait for the Lord? Is your heart glad? In him? Have you trusted in his holy name? Do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? As my friend prayed, Dear Lord, please help me. I think that should be our prayer as well. Lord, help us to navigate 
a world that is chaotic, a world that is twisted at many times. Help us, Lord, help us to navigate how we talk to our friends, how we talk to our neighbors, how do we handle things politically, how do we handle things um, economically in our lives, how do we handle relationships. Lord, help us to put aside our pride and our ego so that we can love on somebody instead of trying to prove them right or wrong. Lord, help us to learn how to be biblical in all of our responses, whether it's living out a moral life, whether it's living out a relationship-based life, whether it's maybe just having a good perspective and saying, you know, Lord, you have blessed me beyond belief. Thank you, Lord. May we shout your praises. May we be glad to sing, to give you thanks, to sing you a new song. But most importantly, help us to be glad in you. And I think if we all make those our prayers, and as a nation we continue to pray those kind of things and we continue to put God first, we'll be, in a, we'll be in a much better situation. Let's pray. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, thank you for your Son. We thank you for the Holy Spirit, Lord. We thank you for just working in our lives, guiding us, convicting us, teaching us the way that we should go. Lord, we are naturally a wayward people. Even when we have you in us, we still want to go the wrong direction. We still want to be that sheep that strays. And Lord, I pray and we thank you for being that shepherd that will leave the 99 and come and get the one. Lord, help us to keep you focused in our hearts and in our minds. Help us to keep you focused in our families. Lord, help us to have impact with our grandchildren and our children as they are probably adults and raising their own kids. And Lord, give us advice, give us wisdom as to how we can be an influence, a biblical, godly influence in their lives. How we can show them that when we follow your ways, Lord, following your ways is what gives us freedom. Following the world's way is what puts us into bondage and sin. And Lord, we pray for your way. And Lord, we pray for your strength to help us to make the right decisions so that we are headed in the right direction as a nation, as a people, and as individuals, and as a church. Lord, we love you, and we thank you for your forgiveness, and you're willing to put up with people like us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.